I'm turning today to Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 13 and verse 14. Romans chapter 13, verse 14. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. And our subject is how Christ is put on. But before looking at verse 14, if we may go back to the 13th verse, let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness and so on. And I'd like to begin there. As you know, from chapter 12 of Paul's letter to the Romans, he turns from the doctrines of the faith to practical application and to the life of the believer, the life to be lived. And we've been looking from the beginning of verse 12, the beseeching of the apostle to us by the mercies of God to offer up the body as a living sacrifice. And by the body, he means the whole life, of course, which is our reasonable service or reasonable, logical, rational worship. And do you remember, I remind you week by week, we considered the two forms of worship that are there referred to by the apostle, the kind of worship we do in this service when we directly address our souls to God and sing his praise and worship him in prayer and declare his word to our own hearts. And then the other form of worship, which is the sacrificing of the body, the dedicating of the whole life day by day to Christ. And both are covered in that verse. And it introduces all the exhortations. But coming down to chapter 13 and verse 13, we're in the middle of a veritable string of analogies or figures or illustrations. The Apostle Paul from verse 11, knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. Sleep and waking will be employed by him in these verses. Waking up. And then in verse 12, night and day. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. So there are the works of darkness and there are the works of the day or of light. So one analogy just replaces another. In fact, they run together to some extent through these verses. Then in verse 13, there is the walk as an illustration of the Christian life. And uh, so on, it proceeds to, well, clothing in verse 12 again. Let us cast off the works of darkness and the uh, implied figure there is clothing which is referred to again later and let us put on the armor of light which is of course a form of clothing and then in verse 14 that's picked up but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ so constantly there, are the, there is figurative language and the use of analogy by the apostle. Verse 13, let us walk honestly, and I cannot resist the uh, uh, temptation to deal with that word walk. The apostle uses it elsewhere also as a figure of the Christian life and the method and the means of living it. Also he uses for the Christian life elsewhere uh, more than once, the illustration of a race. So when he wishes to speak of effort and urgency and zeal, he employs the illustration of a race. When he wishes to illustrate other aspects of the Christian life, it becomes a walk. And we ought to pause there and think of it for a few moments. To what extent does our spiritual life resemble a walk? It's a challenge, in fact, to us. A walk is a very steady activity. It suggests consistent, habitual things which are done. There was much walking in those days. Most people had to walk even to distant destinations. So it was a methodical, regular process. Everybody knew how to do that, but a walk is a matter of habit. You have to keep a, 
reasonable straight line, follow the path, follow the road. You cannot be like a child, scampering off, uh, first of all in one direction, then in another. Child finds it very difficult to hold to a straight course and soon gets worn out and tired, has to be carried or something of that nature. But adults walk, and the Christian life is a walk. And most young Christians, when they get into trouble, they get it, spiritual trouble and difficulty, and they lose assurance and wander from the track and are easily tempted and drawn aside. It's because they haven't yet grasped the genius of walking. It's something steady. You carry out your personal devotions every day. If you can, at the same time, you safeguard that time. It's precious to you. you unless there's some emergency, you won't deviate. You won't vary it. It's like a walk. It's a great secret, if I may use that term, of the Christian life. To be regular, to form habits, to keep at things. And then your spiritual life maintains its vigor. And you maintain your communion with the Lord and with the word of God. And you deepen and progress. Walk is a brilliant illustration. The Christian life is a walk. Well, is our Christian life a walk? Does it answer to that? Or do we have very little time for system and order, consistency, habits, regularity? It's so important. And it's not just advice. It's, it's biblical counsel. Let us walk. So we think a little more about walk. A walk also pictures progress. That's obvious. You walk from one point and steadily you reach another point. A walk suggests progress. And there all, always ought to be progress. We examine our hearts daily. We pray for deliverance from sin and we strive. We want to see progress. We want to see ourselves more effective in our Christian lives and witness. Walking is a figure of maturity. I've already mentioned children. They scamper. They rush about in different directions, cover far more ground, but fruitlessly. But maturity is suggested by a steady walking pace. Patience, of course, is suggested. Obviously, I need hardly say, a destination is in view. You take a journey as in ancient times, not by car, not by train, but by walking to another town, maybe miles away. But you've got that destination in mind. You don't lose heart on the journey unless you completely forget where you're going, who you're going to see, what business you're going to do. You've got to have a purpose to maintain a long, patient walk. And you have to have a purpose in the Christian life. And we have the most glorious purpose. And yet all of us, foolishly, often take our mind off the destination so that we're not uh, proceeding in our spiritual walk with purpose and uh, an objective in view. And there's very little meditation on the eternal glory and the last day to which we work and the coming of Christ or our being taken to him earlier. So, dear friends, you keep that in view very much. Young people in particular very seldom will contemplate or consider or meditate on the end of the journey. But it's very important to have it in view. It's large in your mind. And that's walking. That keeps you going. Uh, walking is a very active deportment. It's, you, you can do all sorts of things walking that you can't possibly do when you're running, when you're pursued perhaps, and you're running as fast as you can. You can't reflect and think all your energy and somehow it seizes your mental energy too and snatches it from you. All your energy is on that frantic activity. But when you walk, you can think, or these days perhaps you can phone. You can do all sorts of things. You can multitask when you're walking, not when you're running. And that illustrates the Christian life. You observe when you walk. You don't see, at least most people don't, 
unless you're very used to running. I know uh, people who run with their ear phone on and listening even to my messages of people who tell me. They take me running with them. Well, I'm glad they do it that way. But uh, so you, to some extent, you can focus on things, but you have to be practiced at it. Most people, when they run, they can't think of anything. And you don't, you don't observe what you're running past. You don't look at the countryside or the surroundings. When you walk, you can do all those things. And that is the Christian life. It's a reflective life. It's a thinking life. You know what you're about. You plan good. You pray even as you proceed. The walk illustrates it wonderfully. It's a very active deportment. It's considered. It's disciplined. You don't digress. We do, unfortunately, in the Christian life. We, we intended that today we would achieve this, this, and this. And we would pray and we would witness. And we would see this person and that person. But en route, we digress too many times. Especially, I keep going at the young, I'm sorry about this, but especially when you're, you're young, your mind is adventurous. And you digress into all sorts of things, day after day. And so you don't accomplish as much. You need the illustration of the walk to tie you in to planned objectives. It's a, it's a great figure for the spiritual life. It's a considered life, a thoughtful life. Well, let's carry on with verse 13. Let us walk honestly, our translators have suggested. Well, the Greek is a difficult term to translate. It's a compound word, and it means well-formed or well-shaped. Very often it means, and some people translate it this way, some of the versions, Decently, walk decently. But that's rather to limit the sense. Uh, walk honorably. Well, that's good, but that would limit the sense a little too. Perhaps something like honestly is maybe nearer the mark after all in the context. The context is uh, as in the day. Let us walk honestly as in the day. So I think, uh, yes, Decently, honorably, but more genuinely. Walk genuinely. It's daytime. You're seen. You're watched. You're observed. You have a witness. You're representing your Savior, the Lord. Be a genuine person. Transparent, if you like. So honestly isn't bad because it suggests all that. Let us walk honestly in the sense of being a genuine person. After all, in the night would suggest people who are up to no good, who are proceeding furtively. Never let a Christian man or woman walk furtively with dark secrets, with secret sins, with things happening in your life and things that you're doing that you wouldn't want fellow believers to know about. So, this is the sense, let us walk, with all that a walk implies, genuinely, transparently, honestly, as in the day, as people who observed, not doing anything that would discredit the testimony and cause us to be ashamed, not ever involved in gossip or unpleasantness, never flying off the handle and losing self-control and being peevish in the family, at work, where we're observed. But we're representing Christ. We're going to put him on and be worthy of him. And so we're going to pray for self-control and to surmount those things and to be those who react well to every situation and circumstance. Let us walk honestly as in the day. I mustn't spend too long with verse 13 because I want to get in to verse 14. Not in rioting. That's a very interesting word, rioting. Uh, again, um, uh, what's the sense of it? Rioting and drunkenness. Well, yes, the word means anything which is noisy, clamorous, 
which is a, has a kind of hypnotic effect, which is a form of inebriation, even if drinking and drunkenness isn't linked with it. The Greek is, again, quite difficult. It's a term which comes from describing something which is about to burst. It's used in Greek literature to describe a great wave which is accumulating mass just as before it comes crashing down as a foaming breaker. It's got that potential to explode. It's also used in Greek literature to describe a loosening of things. You can see the way the word is going. Not in riotous, noisy behavior, carousing behavior. Um, were Christians likely to be involved in that? Well, no, not according to their new nature, given to them at conversion, but the social pressure was immense, especially at that time, even among the Jews, but let alone among the Gentiles, the pagan nations, in society, in your family. This was a big thing. They frequently, mobs were common, social noisy functions were common in which people let themselves go, let the tension build up, enjoyed a kind of altered state of consciousness and just riotous behavior, not rioting in the sense of necessarily rebelling against anything. Well, it's common today, but it was very common then. Every family get together in a pagan nation, among the Romans, among the Greeks, every family get together would involve, well, I suppose today it would be commonly called a, a knees up, where they let their hair down and they let themselves go and they release tensions and sang and shouted at the tops of their voices and danced and jumped up and down and so on. A kind of emotional frenzy, a form of inebriation, if you like, and often alcohol would be involved, but not necessarily. The whole idea is to diminish reason. Here we are, human beings, made with the power of reason and self-control, made to think, the mind is the great palace of thought and of faith. But there seems to be a crazy desire in fallen human flesh to get rid of the mind, at least at times. And people call it enjoying themselves. Dull it down, turn it down, get rid of it, jettison it, so that we can be uninhibited and just fling ourselves around and enjoy an altered state of consciousness. It is a kind of non-alcoholic inebriation, but usually involves that as well. I remember reading the account of a man who, long dead now, became deputy editor of the Times, but he had a very rough childhood, and uh, though he became, to some extent, a man of letters, and he, he writes in his uh, autobiography about how his family would go with all the cockneys of uh, central London of those days, because they couldn't afford holidays, to go hop picking. And every night there would be uh, liquor and they would be in tents or in huts and there would be the great uh, event for them of uh, singing and dancing pub songs and so on, and they were all illuminated by lanterns. And he remembered as a little boy being fascinated, not just by the noise, but by the rhythmic swaying of bodies and shadows in the light of these lanterns. And everybody got, got entirely carried away and forgot their sorrows and their troubles. Altered states of consciousness, suppressing the mind and the power of reason, letting the animal emerge. That's, I'm spending too long on this, but that's what it is. Not in rioting and drunkenness. The converts, the Christian believers, they didn't want to do that anymore, though the social pressures were great. And they could be drawn into it for the sake of family, for the sake of job 
and trade guild for the sake of all these things. No, a Christian is apart from that. Of course, it, it's back today. Well, it's, it's never ceased, I suppose. But in our society today, you get the great rock concerts and so on. Same thing. Get an altered state of consciousness. Get, uh, even if there's no, the, the liquor isn't flowing. Uh, diminish the mind. Get away from a humanness. No release and an uninhibited emotional experience. And even Christians do it. And you think of things like, well, some of the rock concerts associated even with evangelical Christianity. You see that passion conference in the United States with tens of thousands of youngsters, students and others getting themselves thoroughly carried, carried away. But actually, the scripture forbids it. It's right here. Let us walk honestly, genuinely, as in the day, as people of the day, not in rioting, and that is exactly what the Greek word translated rioting refers to, suppression of the rational mind, to get pleasure from your baser instincts and parts. Drunkenness, chambering, which literally in the Greek means bedding, and the modern translations will quite properly say adultery, and wantonness, uncontrolled, yielding to lust, not in strife and envying, but put ye on, I'm coming to verse 14, put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a remarkable statement. Your mind goes immediately to where the Apostle Paul uses the same figure, put off these sins, put on these standards of righteousness. But it's not quite the same. You find great passages to that effect in Ephesians chapter 4, in Paul's letter to the, to, to the Colossians also, chapter 3, put off, put on. And in those passages, he's saying, put off this kind of conduct, put on this kind of conduct. But here he doesn't quite say that. He certainly says in the passage, put off the behavior of the night, but now he does something different. And it's important to observe that it is different. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, using all the titles of the Lord. His Lord, his personal name, Jesus, and his official term, Christ, the Anointed One and Savior. So, in a sense, this is impossible. He's not explicitly talking about putting off this or that sin, but that would all be implied, of course. He's talking about putting on Christ, and yet he uses all his terms and that's not possible because he is divine, because he is Lord of glory. He is God as well as man. I cannot put that on. I cannot assume to myself deity and his perfections and his beauty and his power and take that to myself and put it on. So we have to think what he means. What does he mean when he says, you put on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's profound and it's important. How do we put on Christ? Well, before I answer that, it is very important to take this seriously and to do this and to find out what it is. And if I can speak negatively for a moment, our trouble is we do not enough consciously put on Christ. I'll explain what I mean. We go out into a working day and we just operate spiritually on autopilot. We take it as it comes. We do our work, carry out our profession, do our duties, everything that falls to us, and we deal with things as they come. What we're supposed to do as Christian people, yes, do all that, but we're supposed to do something else at the beginning of every working day. We are supposed to especially dedicate ourselves and our lives to him and seek 
to live as representatives of him and seal it in our conscious minds every day. And if we do that, and if we mean that, it makes a tremendous difference to the way we live spiritually during the day. We're not just taking all the knocks and the duties of life as they come and fumbling our way through. We've yielded ourselves and seen ourselves as his servants and his representatives at the very beginning. This is what is meant by put on the Lord Jesus Christ, just as you would put on clothes, just as you would prepare yourself in a physical manner from the world, for the world, put on Christ. Remind yourself that you're his and that you're his representative. And that's something we should consciously and constantly do. But it slips. We take it as red. And then we forget to do it. And then we're not consciously prepared to live for him. Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's uh, think about how we put him on. Well, first of all, put on his righteousness. His imputed righteousness, call it to mind, put it on. It's a good thing, it's only a component, it's only an introduction. Remind yourself every day that you stand in the imputed righteousness of Christ. He suffered and died to bear away your sin. He imputed to you his righteousness. When God looks upon you, he looks upon you as clad in the righteousness of Christ. This is a doctrinal approach to daily living. Christians, all of us, we need encouragement and we need strengthening and we need comfort. Sometimes you might say to the preacher, to the pastor, give me some comfort, something to comfort me, something to encourage me and strengthen me. And the pastor, if he's working according to the scripture, will say, well, here is your encouragement, and he will give you a doctrinal fact. Oh, you may think, I didn't want a doctrinal fact. I wanted a word of encouragement. Well, yes, but the doctrinal fact is the greatest encouragement. I have often said this, but there was a wonderful Puritan book by Thomas Watson. It, I always think of the original title, and the title under which it's now published flees my mind. But the original title was A Cook in the Lot. It's got a much better title now, and I've clean forgotten what it is. However, uh, I remember talking to somebody who was given this book as a means of comfort in bereavement, as it happened, and was surprised. I thought I would have been given what I expected, was a book of advice and counsel and comfort about how to deal with bereavement. But this Puritan book didn't give me anything like that. It told me about Christ and what he'd done for me as a Christian and his work on my behalf. And then after a while, the recipient of this book, the penny dropped, realized that this was the greatest comfort and the most substantial comfort. So we comfort with doctrine. You start the day, if you can, with this thought, I am under Christ. His blood was shed to bear away the punishment due to me for my sin, and his righteousness, his perfect life, is imputed to me. I am justified, which means God will not look at me anymore as a sinner, but God will reward me as though I deserved the rewards of righteousness because I have been given, it's been imputed to me, the righteousness of Christ, and I stand on that. Then when the devil attacks, when I'm tempted to doubt, when I'm filled with dismay or depression or disappointment, I think of what he has done for the soul and my standing in him before God. There's nothing more precious. 
There's nothing greater. And I prepare myself. This is what we should do. We should be able to say, I prepare myself with these thoughts. I put on Christ. His righteousness has been imputed to me and I put on that righteousness by thinking about it, by reflecting on it. And then it's harder for me to sin. If he came into this world to suffer and to die and to live a life of perfection for me so that his righteousness could forensically be imputed to me, how can I lightly sin? How can I dismay and disappoint him? How can I live taking advantage of his imputed righteousness and succumbing easily to sin? I will put up then a much better fight. How do we put him on? Well, we put him on at the beginning of the day by taking up as almost as though we were putting on a coat or a jacket. We put, take upon ourselves his commands, his standards. These are my standards. His tastes, his mission. I will take upon myself his mission. His mission will be my mission. I live for souls. You can say to yourself, I live for the souls of my children. I live for the souls of my colleagues. I live for the souls of those around me. I take up the mission of Christ and I put it on like a garment, like an element of clothing. I put him on in my plans. Oh, I would have planned so freely to do one thing and another. I would have maybe gallivanted round the country, round the world, been a great tourist, done all sorts of things to indulge my pleasure and my fancy. But I put him on, putting on his purposes and his plans. And I realize I'm his representative. I've got to have a purpose, a spiritual purpose for what I do. I can't lightly make all those plans anymore that were just for me. I'm putting on Christ, his mission, his purpose. Is there anything in this for him? Is the reason for doing this to bring glory to his name? I have put on Christ. He will not deprive me of all leisure and pleasure, but I put him first. My life now since I've been saved and I'm on the road to heaven, and I have his love and his nearness and his power with me, my life is going to be for his mission. I'm his representative. I will seek his guidance. I will think about everything I do and commit it to prayer. I will put on his tastes. I will think of him in prayer and when I'm handling temptation. I will see him and put him on as my protector through the day, are you touched by depressive thoughts? Self-deprecating thoughts? Does the enemy of souls take advantage of these? Make you feel wretched and a person without purpose? Make you feel condemned? Make you at times feel perhaps you, you can't be a believer and take away your salvation? See him as your protector. Pray to him, put him on as your armor and your protector and take everything to him and trust him and his power. But hell, said Isaac Watts, hell shall fly at thy rebuke and Satan hide his head. He knows the terrors of thy look and hears thy voice with dread. They're great words based on Psalm 13. But dear friends, put on Christ to protect you from the assaults of Satan and from strong temptation. He is your master. He is your life. He is your physician. He'll deal with your temper. He'll deal with your desire for things excessively. He'll deal with your pride. He'll help you rise above all these things. Put him on. I trust him today, say, 
to be my physician, to be my power, to be my inspiration. To put him on is also to bring him near. I was asked after we went through verse 11 for a little more information on the second part of the verse and that knowing the time that now it is high time to wake out of sleep these words for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed well it does become nearer in many senses and in one very precious sense as you go through the Christian life as you learn more of him as you experience more of his nearness and his power and his guidance and his goodness, the end, the coming again of Christ or your own being taken into eternity, the end is much more in your view. You can think about it more. You can see more of it with the eye of faith. It's increasingly valued and desired. So it is true. The second part of verse 11. Now is our salvation nearer than when we believed or first believed. It's clearer in your mind. It's looming larger in your desire and in your view. It's worked for with increasing urgency. It's much nearer now than when you first believed. It's more obviously the fulfillment of prophecy. As life goes on more and more, you can see that what is happening in the world and in society and around you, how closely it tallies with the prophecies of what will happen to the world as time moves on. You are all the more convinced you were when you were saved. You were sure, you were fully persuaded of the rightness of salvation and of the Bible and of Christ. But it grows increasingly clear and evident and you're all the more convinced there is no other hope but Christ for the individual and for the world. Now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. And back to verse 14, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put him on. Beginning of every day, if you can, consciously dedicate yourself to him as his representative. You're going to show forth his praises. You're going to wear him, as it were, on your heart and on your clothing. You're going to manifest his, the life that he's given you. So it's quite different from simply put on his works of righteousness as in Ephesians and Colossians. It's put ye on Christ himself, the Lord of glory. You found him when you were saved. He came to you, he made you his own. Now put him on daily to rule your life and to use you in his own mission and in his service. Have I time for those last words? only in a sentence or two, make not provision for the flesh. What a brilliant way of putting it. Some of the modern translations, they translate the Greek as it can be translated and they have no forethought, give no forethought, they say, to the flesh, to the sinful nature. Well, it amounts to the same thing, but make not provision is much better than much clearer. Never plan. Never think about or arrange things that would serve to pander to the flesh and bring you to fall to fleshly things. I don't know whether this will surprise you, What's the size of your TV set? Is it, I've forgotten what the width, the di diagonal are now, is it 50 something inches, 60 inches, bigger, smaller? 
This verse seems to say to me, keep it down. Keep it down. What? I'm not going to tell you what. People will say that's legalism. Just keep it down. Make not provision for the flesh. It's obvious, isn't it? And you can apply that in 101 areas of your life. Don't acquire things. Do things. Be found in places that would be a temptation to your old, fallen, sinful nature. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. Why, that would be a great motto for New Year's Day. May the Lord help us in all these things and to represent him most of all. Let's